All right. Hey, Windsor. Uh, welcome back to another edition of the Elders and Deacons discussing a confession of faith. Let's begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the work of many that have gone before us, and we thank you and praise you that we can gather and open your word together and to learn these doctrines as they are articulated. And we thank you especially for this, this one, this chapter on Christ, who is our Savior and our great hope. And uh, we pray this in his name. Amen. 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 The order of reading tonight shall be Phil, Ray, Don, Jim, John, Gordon, Al, myself. Paragraph eight, beginning in this in the text box here. I'll read it. To all those are for whom Christ has purchased redemption. He does certainly and effectually apply and communicate the same, making intercession for them and revealing unto them in and by the word the mysteries of salvation, effectually persuading them by his spirit to believe and obey and governing their hearts by his word and spirit, o overcoming all their enemies by his almighty power and wisdom in such manner and ways as are most consonant to his, uh, his wonderful and unsearchable dispensation. Okay, so if we can start reading. Oh, so, John 6, 37. Uh, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Okay, I guess that's clear for everybody. Okay, let's keep keep filing along. We'll try to expedite it. We're at uh, John 10, John chapter 10, verse 15, and uh, verse 16. Starting at verse 15. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep, that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Okay, that alludes to Jews and Gentiles. Uh -huh. Okay, next reader. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Very good. Wow. And I'm next. Okay, and it's just 34, Romans 8, 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Okay, it's just reiterating what we read in the, in the uh, confession. The next verse. See, that, that's me, I think. Yes. Yes. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Let me just fill in 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. In verse 15, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, 
I have made known to you. That one might might deserve a comment. Sure, go ahead. Any any time, Pastor, if you see one. With, yeah, you know, see, see in there how God is um, giving us the mind of Christ regarding salvation. He calls us friends, and He reveals to us uh, these things that have been hidden. Um, uh, it's just an amazing thing that He gives us insight about these things. He gives us an ability to understand uh, these things. Yes, and and that is that is done through His Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and by His Word. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very good. Next reader. Okay, this is uh, Ephesians 1, 7, 8, and 9. Uh, in him we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of our sins or our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose which he sets forth in Christ. Interestingly, this particular passage is the first of, of the passages that we use in the uh, faith evangelism uh, witness uh, situation where uh, in him, of course, the him in this case is Christ and we are redeemed uh, through his blood and we have the forgiveness of our sins because of his marvelous grace. We didn't deserve it. He gave it to us freely uh, as we come to know him and know him as Lord and Savior. Uh, and it is lavished upon us. It is given to us uh, in, in, great, in great volume. There is nothing that we need beyond what, what he gives us uh, relative to our salvation. So, Very good. Yeah. Okay. Next verse then. Is, is after. That must be me. Yeah. John 17, verse 6. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Very good. So what does this say about um, who's in charge, and when did the decision occur? from me it was god's ultimate plan of salvation which was put down uh prior to creation mm -hmm. he knew he knew everything mm -hmm. that's right very good let's i guess we should keep moving next next reader then john 14 26 but the helper the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So this would be something originally spoken to the disciples, um, which that is a big verse for the canonicity of the New Testament, uh, being the authority of the apostles. Um, and, uh, but it's also something that God does with <clears throat> us that... Um, I, I believe that there's another layer where we as believers are reminded of um, what we have put in and what we have meditated on from his word. Um, and God uses that in our day-to-day -day lives to guide us. Good passage also that reminds me that uh, when Jesus returned to the father, uh, he did not abandon us. He gave us uh, the Holy Spirit uh, with power, uh, he, he was called alongside. I think it's Paracletos, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Paracletos. So, yeah, so that we, you know, we have, we have the power of, of Christ within us. He did not let us, he does not leave us alone, uh, but uh, we have this, this power that uh, will be with us, that will enable us to, uh, to remember and to teach and the baptized. Very good. 
Okay, next reader then. And this, this applies to effectually persuading them by his spirit to believe and obey and governing their hearts by his word and spirit. So this is Hebrews 12, 2. Um, I think it's worth starting in one. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Very good. So you see in here how he is both the author and perfecter. And uh, some in Christian circles would say that he kind of gets us started by salvation and then lets us, um, lets us go on to prove ourselves by our works. Um, but that's really not the case. What, he's, what, he has, what he does is when the Holy Spirit is in us, the works will be sure to follow. Um, if as long as the Lord has done it, he will bring it to pass. He perfects our faith through the course of our life. A true believer, that is. Not one who has <laughs> not an insufficient profession from the beginning. Yeah, that's well said, Jim. This is one of those phrases that in the Greek, it sticks in my head. Uh, verse 2 where he's called the author and the perfecter of our faith. And the phrase for author and perfecter is archegon kai teleoton. And the idea is the one that begins it, and he's the one that brings it to the completion at the end. The telos is the, the root word for that second. The arche is like the beginning, and the telos is the end. He's the one that is the starter of it, and he's the finisher of it. He is like, he, he, He's the, um, he sees it through from start to finish. I thought that was R.K. Teleoton. I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's Greek to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's good. Okay. Okay. Um, Next verse. Second Corinthians 4, 13. Uh, since we have the same spirit of faith, According to what has been written, I believe, and so I spoke. We also believe, and we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. So speaking at the uh, time that we'll be with Jesus there, the perfection of that faith that you're speaking uh, he'll raise us all also to be with Jesus and bring us with you to his presence, into his presence. Very good. Everybody good with that one? Okay, we'll keep moving. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. For all who ha are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. Very good. Now, this gets at an interesting point. Um, some people will say that the only prerequisite to being baptized is a profession of faith. But according to this verse, although baptism is not mentioned, the only real believers are ones that have evidence of the Holy Spirit in their lives, mm -hmm. which would be the prerequisite of having a profession of faith, which is the prerequisite of baptism. So the, the baseline is really evidence of the Holy Spirit, whether that produces a profession of faith Verbally, or if it's a mute person, you might see some action change that would um, evidence Christ in them, in his spirit. There's a parallel verse to uh, this first verse 9. Uh, 
where Paul says, the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them for they are spiritually discerned. So we can't know the things of God without the spirit of God. Correct. Any comments, Pastor? Trying to silence the noise over here. I think we're doing well. Okay. Okay, next person in line. That may be John. Is that me? I'm all right. Didn't mean to fall asleep. For I will not venture to speak of anything except that Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around the Elicurum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Yeah. Very good. So God uses human means to accomplish his divine transformation. Mm -hmm. Okay, next verse. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Okay, so it's by God's word. The sanctification process works through. Our hearts, and this is the uh, passage, I think, that kind of lines up with our hearts are governed uh, by his word and spirit. Very good. Next reader. Now, yes. A, this is Psalm 110, verse 1. A Psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. <clears throat> hmm. Very good. And uh, that's referencing this text right here. Overcoming all their enemies by his mighty power and wisdom. So it's a sure thing. Yes. Very good. Okay, next reader. That's me. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Very good. Mm. So what does that what does that mean for us, Pastor? Well, we have enemies. That's one thing. And there are things that oppose us. Um, and Christ is accomplishing victory for us from enemies. And uh, the last to be defeated forever is death. And he has already won that victory. Yes. But at the final resurrection, um, our um, bodies will be raised and immortal with a glorified body. And death will be no more. And um, that is because Christ has accomplished victory over death. Mm -hmm. So we need not fear death. Right. Very good. Okay, next reader. This is Malachi 4, um, which I believe is the, uh, the day of judgment, right? That this is prophesying. Do I have that right? I think you're right, Phil. Day of the Lord. Yeah, um, I think it starts with uh, behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. And then it goes, but for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. And, uh, Very good. Colossians 
Uh, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them in open shame by triumphing over them uh, in him, in, I mean, in, in Christ. And so that Jesus uh, is victorious uh, in the end. And uh, it's not, it's King Jesus. It's not uh, you know, today. It's King Jesus. Tomorrow it's King Jesus. And at the end, it's King Jesus. Mm -hmm. He over sovereign over all kings and authorities, rulers, and yeah. Very good. Great, great comments, gentlemen. You know, can I make one more about these enemies? Sure. One thing that um, I think comes out when we looked at these last few verses is um, a distinction that we have as Christians, and that is that um, other uh, religions, like, and I'm thinking about Islam right now, are um, honor cultures and the people of Islam were told by Muhammad to defend the honor of Muhammad even with force and that's why in the city of Nice in France this past week you have these killings as uh, responses because they are told to defend the honor of of Allah and um, and we are different than that we have a God who says, um, you don't take vengeance for yourself and that belongs to me and I will avenge. And um, it, you are to, uh, you know, like we are to be um, like him in a way that is very different from these honor cultures. And if their prophet is put to shame, they're supposed to take up, um, you know, uh, the sword, what they call it. But when we are, you know, when someone reviles our Lord or when someone reviles us in his name, he says, rejoice and be glad. And he tells us to look to what will be in that, in that moment, that your reward uh, will be great because that's how they treated the prophets who were before you. Um, it's a very, very stark contrast. That's great. Okay, chapter nine, this is a free will, should be a, an interesting one. God hath endued the will of man with that natural liberty that is neither forced nor by any absolute necessity of nature determined to good or evil. Okay, so where do we leave off in our reading order? Who's next? I'm next. I'm next. Matthew 17, 12. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Everybody clear with this one? So God had predetermined the suffering of Christ, and yet it was the, his persecutors' free will in choosing what they did in that. So how God's sovereignty and man's free will mix here is a mystery, yet both are true. Okay, yes. next verse. John 1, 4. but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Mm -hmm. This is referencing uh, uh, the part where God hath endured the will of man. Mm -hmm. Is that clear, everybody? Yeah. Okay, Deuteronomy. Who's after Gordon? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Let me continue reading. This looks good here. 
that you may live loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Very good. Okay, next verse down. It's uh, the next uh, part, part two. Oh, okay, very good. I'll read it. Man, in his state of innocence, had freedom and power to will and to do that which is good and well-pleasing to God. But, but yet, um, mutably, so that he might fall from it. Okay, first verse here is Ecclesiastes 7.29. See, this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. Pretty clear, isn't it? Yep. The original intent was good, but man fell. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Next reader. Genesis uh, 1, 2. Uh, then God said, let us make man in our, in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Okay. Next verse. Pastor, if you see anything that you need to comment on, feel free. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, eat of it, you shall surely die. Pretty clear, right? Yes. Okay. Next next reader, I suppose, is me. Genesis 3, 6. So when the woman, woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eye and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate, okay? So their free will um, obviously led them into sin. Or they chose sin with it. Okay, so this, I guess, we're at the next section. Yes, section three. Man, by his fall into a state of sin, hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man, being altogether averse from that good and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. Any questions on that statement, gentlemen? Just uh, maybe it's a comment. Um, I, I read into this that um, the authors of, of the confession are saying people can do good things, but um, they don't accompany salvation. In other words, of our own will, we're not able to do perfect good and therefore earn salvation by perfect um, execution of the law. And, and yet at the same time, we might do some good things. And I, I heard, um, I want to say it's Alistair Begg on the radio the other day. Um, and he was saying, you know, one of the, the biggest things preventing people from coming to Christ isn't that it's often not that we think we're too bad, 
to be acceptable to him. It's that we think we're too good to be needed, to need him. Um, we think we're too good on our own right. And so it, in a lot of ways before salvation, our works are no measure of who we are as a person before God. That's right. Yeah, this is the one where um, when it comes to free will, there's a big divergence of opinions. And I agree with what Phil just said. It's not that um, an unbeliever can't do any good things uh, from their own will. It's that um, a person with a will that, as, as Luther called it, in bondage to sin, can't, um, can't move towards salvation through that, by that will. Like you can't, um, you can't do the good that leads to salvation um, by your will. It's, um, it's just not there. It's, um, and this is where, um, this, we're recording this on um, the 1st of November. So yesterday was, was the anniversary of Martin Luther and the 95 Theses. So we, we call it Reformation Day. And um, Luther got into a scuffle with a guy named um, Erasmus, who was a humanist and a great scholar. And he compiled a good New Testament with the documents that were of that day. But uh, Erasmus said that people have free will. And he made these statements that were not theologically responsible about the human will. So Luther responded to Erasmus with a book that's called um, The Bondage of the Will. And it's actually very engaging to read um, because it's very funny actually to read, but it's also very, it's like, um, it's, it, it's been described this way that when Erasmus took on Luther on a theological matter of, of human will, it was like a mouse stepping into a boxing ring with an elephant and he got crushed. And it, it's, um, that's the way it is. So Luther's, Luther's explanation on this is that um, it's, it's, it's in line with what this says. And of course, Luther predated this document, but he said um, that our wills are free and yet in sin, they're in bondage to that sin. So maybe I, maybe I gave a little extra there, but this is the point where, where people go in different directions on human will. That's right. And the standard for human will, for perfection in, in will, is um, perfect in motive and in action and purpose. Um, I guess that would be very much like motive. But, and it has to be perfect consistently from beginning of life through to death. If one sin occurs, like with Adam and Eve, that results in separation from God and condemnation. For the wages of sin or death. So no human being could possibly achieve the standard. And even if they could possibly achieve that perfection standard, they still would have to deal with Adam's original sin in the atonement. Okay, gentlemen, I guess we should go to the next verse or next reader. Okay, Romans 5, 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Hallelujah. Mm, amen. Amen. It's good. For the mind, this is Romans 8, 7, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Okay. In John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You're totally dependent upon the Lord Jesus. Yes. And so this is, this is a very important thing for Christians to get into our heads. 
to abide in Christ will produce fruit. Mm -hmm. Good fruit. And we frequently will forget that. And we'll get distracted by a list of accomplishments or activities and forget about our Savior. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me scroll down to the next passage. It is uh, Romans 3, 10 and 12. Right. Yes. Okay. Let's see if I can get it on the screen here. I can handle it from there. Okay. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. And 12, all have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Hmm. So there's a come, there's a, there's a point in Romans where Paul is systematically laying out the gospel and he says the, the utter helplessness of man in sin. Um, these are, these are, um, there's a series of statements in Romans three about just the condition of man under sin. And, um, it's, uh, it has ruined us. We can't, um, we can't will our way out of it. Yeah, I think the previous statement also talks about uh, converting. We can't we can't move once once sin has entered into our life. We cannot convert back to something that is good because they don't overlap goodness and and sin with God. It has to be it has to be purged. It has to be purified, and that's done through Christ. Very good. Okay, next verse. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Uh, verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Hmm. Okay. Very good. So the next one here is Colossians. Colossians 2.13. Uh, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us uh, all our trespasses. Uh -huh. Very good. So now Catholicism would say that the death of Christ took you, uh, took care of your sins up to the point of the present. And from that point forward, you need to do penance and, and the like to maintain your rightness, your right position with God. Mm -hmm. um, but you see here that he's saying that it's once for all. I mean, it's from beginning to end. It's not, not just up until a certain point and then you're on your own okay next reader no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and i will raise him up on the last day and he said this is thy this is why i told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by him to but granted him by the father. Yes. <clears throat> Pastor Ben, not to put you on the spot, but I believe uh, you know this kind of refers to the doctrine of election, does it not? Indeed it does, yeah, Gordon. Indeed, and yeah. um, it fits it fits well with this. I mean the, the passages that we've read um, Romans and Ephesians and Colossians and here in John, um, really the emphasis is that um, what we could not do, God has done. God is the one who rescues us from our rebellion and our sin, and he draws us right. to himself in, in Christ. Right. And this, I think, uh, is, at least to me, and when I, when I read this passage, uh, this is a passage that refers me to uh, one of the principles uh, from Calvin that God's grace 
as he calls us, as he draws us near to him, uh, his grace becomes irresistible to us. We cannot deny it. We, we, we feel it and, and we surrender to it. Yeah, that, yeah, that, um, that's the Synod of Dort, actually, where those, the five points came from. Right. Yeah, from the, the eye and tulip, right? Right, yeah. Yes. Very good. Next reader. Uh, John, I think that might be you. Okay, I'm out. Uh, got my wrong, uh, order wrong. Uh, <clears throat> and you were dead in trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. The spot, the spot, I don't know, I've lost the last portion that of that word. Spirit. Okay. That is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. This passage also shows to me the consistency of scripture. Uh, we have seen a number of times where we are saved by grace, uh, unmerited favor. We didn't earn anything. Amen. Okay, next reader. Um, I believe it's uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The natural person, that's what I, I just uh, talked about before. <laughs> The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. We have to have the Spirit of, of God in Christ within us in order to understand the things of God. Uh, if we don't, we will look at, him, at them foolishly. Uh, this is something also, as, as I've experienced, if people uh, do not see the Bible as authoritative in terms of it be being the word of God, uh, if they if they don't see it that way, it is very difficult uh, to uh, to explain things to them that are that are spiritual because uh, they just they don't have the spirit of God in them and they can't accept it. Uh, it is foolish to them in many in many cases. I saw that uh, when we were talking to. Uh, a couple of people during that uh, that township uh, day, when we had the you know the question and the, and the whiteboard and so forth, uh, as we started to talk to people who did not believe the Bible was God's word, this clearly came out in in that portion of the discussion. If, if you are going to cite to the Bible as being authoritative and they don't see the Bible in in that way, uh, they see it foolishly. It it makes our our uh, ability to, you know, to help them uh, see spiritual things with a great deal of difficulty. Yes, but nonetheless, what you're saying is true, Gordon, but nonetheless, uh, we need to present God's word to those who don't even believe that the Bible has any value or validity because the word will penetrate their hearts, those that God is leading to salvation. That was my case. I didn't believe the Bible. I was an atheist. And someone presented a verse of scripture to me. Um, it was the, the person was an unbeliever. And I heard that verse of scripture and I said, well, God, whatever it takes, I'm all yours. And my life changed. I believe when I talk to my neighbors, <clears throat> I ask them the questions. What is absolute in your life? And most of them look like, what are you talking about? Mm. And then I present, you know, the Bible. The Bible is an absolute word of God. And in that, you will find the way to life, the way you should act. And you can tell if you walk in, in the, what the Bible says that you will have clear thinking of what's going on in this world. 
So mm -hmm. that's, how, that's what I tell my neighbors. And most of them don't think of the Bible as being the absolute word of God. Yeah. It's too disturbing in one's um, fleshly nature to come to grips with that. Yeah, uh, uh, what John or what Don just described is also, you know, the great uh, truth of Second Timothy three sixteen. You know that the Bible is is profitable for everything in life. It's all there for us. You know, um, if, if we remember back before we were converted, if you can remember, like what life was like. I, I mean, I certainly do. I was a teenager. Um, what, what's described here of the natural person, the natural man, that's someone that's disconnected from the spirit of God. It doesn't have that relationship with God that changes our thinking and, and, and puts light on our thinking to understand these things. And as believers, um, it's not like we're completely in the light now uh, because we wrestle with this old nature that's still in us and with the things that God uh, does reveal and has revealed. And so we're kind of being transformed you know, we might, we might think something doesn't make sense, something that's true from God's word that he's told us. And it takes time to sort of overcome that natural person and accept the things of God. Um, uh, and uh, it's a process. You know, this is part of the, the sanctification process. Very good. Okay, next verse, next reader. It's Titus 3, verses 3, 4, and 5. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of our works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Amen. Mm. Isn't that a good one? Yeah. That pretty well sums it up, doesn't it? Uh, one of the... Um striking things about those verses is that's Paul writing and Paul who was a right. Pharisee who adhered strictly to the law is talking about how foolish and disobedient and led astray and slaves to his passions and pleasures and the hate and the hatred that he had and by all accounts he was the righteous one in in Israel um, if you look at it through man's eyes mm. Yeah, I, you know, that, uh, uh, that resonates with me. And then uh, if you take that person who Paul was, you know, that, you know, I heard Pastor Chai talk about this, you know, the first terrorist, and how did he get to be a, you know, he had to be reborn, he had to be go through this new conversion process, if you will. And so that uh, in verse five, it says, but according by the washing uh regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. And it sort of talks about that mystery of, you know, how God was went into his heart, I believe. And when we talk about a rebirth that happened to Nicodemus, you know, we talk about the conversion process and Paul had to go through that conversion process, the washing, regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit had to do that. Nothing of what we done, he done, definitely you can see in there that contrast of what you brought up, Bill, uh, you know, it was all, all God, you know, all the Holy Spirit, all, mm. you know, that was just, that resonates what you said, you know. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, it, and actually it's uh, what Phil says, an excellent point. Uh, uh, Paul in, in Philippians describes himself as, you know, as one who had really credentials that were superior to everyone. Uh, you know, he describes that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, circumcised on the eighth day. He was a Benjamite. He was all these things, but, you know, he came to realize none of that was sufficient for him, you know, and it, yeah. we were foolish to think that it could be. 
You know, this verse four, it, it really stands out to me as we read it, because it says, when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared um, in our uh, disobedience and in our slavery to sin until God breaks through, um, we just don't know that God is good in the way that we do when we see Christ as it's revealed in the scriptures. And I was... Um, you know, I often get back to Romans chapter 10 about how faith comes by hearing and the important thing is for the word of God to advance and to go forth and, and God works in that way. God reveals his, his goodness and his loving kindness to people as that's happening. And that's how he wakes us up. That's how he brings us into his kingdom. And um, that's how he, 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 he causes this regeneration in us and it's an awakening to see the goodness of God. It's, it's like, Oh, I, you know, you don't even realize it uh, maybe. And then you come under conviction and you, you see this beautiful, you see the beauty of God. Um, you see the goodness of God and um, it, it appears. <laughs> and it's, it's a good, it's a nice word picture there of how God, how God redeems us, how he saves us. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. John, um, would you be so kind as to close us in prayer? Sure. Father, again, we thank you for the gift of your word. It's not just any other book that is similar to, it is similar to nothing because it is your word only coming from the mouth of God Almighty. So we thank you for this opportunity to be together, to study it, to understand it in even a better way, and again, to live it in our lives each day. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name.